Oh, absolutely fantastic. If it looks like I'm wearing the same shirt with the same stain on it in the same position, drinking the same can, because I am. It's because we're doing back-to-back -back episodes today. So my autism is going to be maybe potentially slurred. I'm extremely caffeinated, so, you know, maybe this will be a really good episode. But here we are. I'm leaving it up to chance this one hope you fuckers enjoyed anyway not that i've not that i've ever really super heavily constructed a detailed approach to one of these so basically the only thing that's changed is that i'm doing one after the other which i don't think i've done before maybe not separated by a day because i usually do them on tuesdays thursdays anyway um, I've got some quotes that I'm circling back to uh, from one of the greatest teachers that I've ever come across. And if I would have been able to meet this person, you know that question that people ask you, they're like, oh, if you could have dinner with anybody who would be past, present or tense, uh, you could pick anyone in the world. It would be Alan Watts for me, undeniably, uh, undeniably. They, they talk about a, uh, there's a story with this guy called Ram Dass and he's like this, spiritual guru teacher guy and he was like i had uh had drinks with alan watts in the 70s and we both got fucking obliterated and it was about three o'clock in the morning and he looks over i forget what he said actually fuck that's gonna annoy me um he looked over to him and said something he goes you know what your problem is um you just like you take things too seriously or something like that um fuck that's actually gonna really annoy me I, I will try and I'll try and find the video at another episode and I'll come back to it because it's a really funny story. But I think that uh, he would be a phenomenally interesting character to converse with on so many different points and just feed him little puzzles that you could watch him solve in real time. I think that would be really interesting. I think Carl Jung would be a really interesting guy as well. And it's no mistake that these guys all essentially were in a similar circle to each other there's there's a lot of reference points for alan watts talking about carl jung's work and uh, vice versa and then you got the ram das guy in the mix and everything else and you haven't heard of these people i very very heavily recommend you get into uh some of their lectures and their books and their teachings there's a lot of stuff that's freely available through the magic of the internet and youtube i have probably listened to about 300 hours or more of alan watts podcasts like if you just he doesn't have a podcast obviously he died a fair while ago but if you type in alan watts on like spotify or apple podcasts you'll be able to find a whole litany of lectures that he's done and he just has this first of all he has a phenomenal british accent and a very old school way of speaking he's phenomenally articulate but the way that he describes things really cuts out a lot of the noise and i get that compliment quite a fair bit that i don't really attribute a lot of fluff to the things that I say. And that's very deliberate, probably as a result of listening to so much of this man speak. Um, he's got a fucking great way of looking at things. It's not unique to him, but it's unique in the way that he explored it from a Westerner's perspective onto an Eastern philosophy, like Taoism and Buddhism and uh, all of the other isms, autism. <laughs> but we'll crack on. Man suffers only because he takes seriously what the gods made for fun. And that, that basically is this existence, right? We, we take things seriously because, I've talked about this a lot, but we extrapolate to death and we do it all the time. And we think, well, if this doesn't work, then I won't be able to do this. And if I can't do this, then I can't eat. If I can't eat, I'll starve. If I starve, I'll die. We always do it, every single time. And when we get to this taking seriously business we think that the loss of a job is going to be the end of us we think that a loss of a relationship is going to be the end of us we think that a heated conversation might be the end of the uh, relationship we think that a terrible re review will be the end of business we think that someone cutting us off will be the end of our existence because how dare they do that and uh, the audacity that they have to, to, to even think that that would be an acceptable action. 
or you, your kid says something and they get in trouble at school and you think they're going to be a loser because of that or you think that they're going to get shit grades and not, not uh, excel because of that. And the way that I've taken to understand that Alan Watts thinks about this entire thing is that it really is just a game. You don't get too serious when you play games because you realize the 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 non it's genuine but it's non-serious that's how i try and describe it serious would be finite and genuine would be infinite like you can take things genuinely without being so bummed out when they don't work out or on the other hand cra- going to crazy highs when they do work out and you always see these images you think of when people win the lotto And they think it's this crazy high and it's going to last forever. They're never, ever, 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 ever going to come down. And that's their perception. They think, oh, my life's changed. It's absolutely unbelievable. I've never been to high heights and I'm just ecstatic and so grateful, blah, blah, blah. And then reality sets in where they get pulled back into an equilibrium. And you think about, let's say you won $20 million from the lotto. Then you think about, well, I'm going to get taxed. 30 or 40 percent of that so i really haven't won 20 million dollars i've probably won closer to 15 and then i've got to think about well i have no idea how to make 15 million dollars so that means i have no idea how to keep it and also means i have no idea how to multiply it so i'm at a significant disadvantage in in terms of the education behind this which means I'm going to have to learn a lot of stuff. I'm going to have to learn a lot of hard lessons because if I don't do this right, I'm going to spend it all. I'm going to have no money left. I'm not going to be able to buy food and I'm going to die. And this, that's basically the articulation of how we think about problems in our own head. And you went from this crazy high high to now this crazy low low to where it all balances out. But it's only because you were taking it so seriously. Imagine what a kid would do in comparison, if you gave them 20 marshmallows, not $20 million, I have no idea what money is. You gave them 20 marshmallows, they'd be like ecstatic. But if you then took one away, they wouldn't really be all that serious about it. They'd be like, well, I've still got 19. Pretty good. They'd, You know what? They probably wouldn't even know how many you gave them. They'd probably be preoccupied with eating them and stuffing their face and having the time of their life. And I really think that it is this childlike wonderment, this embodiment of the child's mind that we lose somewhere along the way. Everybody likes to call it innocence. And in some part, it is. But I like to think about this childlike wonderment in a sense of what would my my five-year-old self be going through at this stage? Would they even conceive of the seriousness of it? And you start to think about it in terms of like social roles. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a really serious big time lawyer and people need to take me seriously because I earn half a million dollars a year and it's all very serious and I drive a Lexus. <laughs> no one gives a fuck. <laughs> it's not really that important when you think about it. But people carry themselves this way and they become very rigid in their livelihoods, and they, they become very attached to their social roles. They say, well, I'm from this family lame, and I have this job title, and I drive this car, and all this is very important to me. Versus the person who is taking their life far less seriously, they're like, yeah, I, you know, I, uh, I'm slowly but steadily moving towards things that I want to achieve, and I know that some of them might not happen, and I know that some of them might happen. And I know that I'm probably going to be marching in that direction regardless of whether I do or don't happen because I'm starting to figure out that I do things because I really enjoy doing them or I find uh, a, a great intrinsic pleasure from, from pursuing these things. Or I recognize that it is also helping other people around me the fact that I am pursuing down this path or down this road. And that gets to serve as a, uh, a shining example to the other people around me. It's a very different energetics. It's a very different landscape. It's a very different reality that you live within because the first person, what happens if they lose their job? They go into existential crisis because that was part of who they were because they took it so seriously. The second person would have a very hard time finding themselves in an existential crisis because they've already modulated their perspective correctly. 
they've already gone, well, I'm charging towards this thing because I know that it's important and it encapsulates me and I find that I derive great pleasure from the pursuit of this. Meaning that some of the results are going to come and some of them might not. I don't know which ones are which, but I'm going to have fun finding out anyway. Now you've just opened up this world of possibility, this gamification of existence. Nobody really knows. I have a, a, a mate of mine who runs a supplement company. He has not the fondest fucking clue why certain products go stratospheric and why some products absolutely eat a bag of dicks. He has no idea. And he's an extremely well-educated individual with decades of product research as it relates to gym stuff and lifting weights and what people would want out of certain things and still can't figure it out. <laughs> it's just, it's, just it's, it's baffling. Even this shit that I drink, everyone's like, canned water won't work, you fucking idiots. They're now a $700 million company. They sell water in a can to idiots like me. Still not sponsored. Fucking dogs. <laughs> but that's the, that's the serious approach. They look at all the market data and they look at all the analytics and they go, oh, that, well, you can't just put a fucking rose gold lid on a can of water. No one will ever buy that. Well... I am. <laughs> so you never you never really know what's going to work, what's going to work, and you really really never know what isn't going to work. So really, you've just got to have a crack and take a swing and, and see what happens. But if you remain serious about it, you're like, well, you know what? I'm going to save up and I'm going to make sure that I have enough money to really give this a good try. And if it doesn't work, then I'll go and do something else. But I really want it to work and I, I got to ensure that it does. It's a very serious, rigid approach. Versus you like, this is how I've sort of governed um, my decision-making skills and a lot of the different adventures that I've been on. And I'm like, I don't have the money or a safety blanket or anything really to pursue this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because what if it works? Fuck it. Let's find out. I've told this story before. I think one, one of the first episodes I did in the studio is that I started, uh, well, I was chasing a dream of pursuing my um, professional rugby league career and I went to Canberra with 400 bucks I don't recommend it it was a bad idea <laughs> it's a bad idea not to save any money but I did anyway and um, had to make some fucking significant financial sacrifices while I was down there and I started my first uh, like proper business like my personal training business with 300 bucks or 500 bucks like two years later so I clearly learned from the first example, but uh, yeah, I didn't. And it was it was not even like one of these scenarios where I said to myself, well, this has to work. Because if I was so used to living, walking around with 400 bucks left over, it wouldn't be that serious if I ended up there again. You, you really can start to envisage it like that. It's like, how much worse can I get? Yeah, I could have zero, but zero to 300 isn't this big stratospheric jump. I could make 300 bucks in a day. And so that's how I started to look at it. I had that playful, playful sort of nature. And Homozi talks about this a lot. He goes, well, my plan B, if my business never worked out, was that I could do Uber during the day, which was flexible and gave me time to articulate business ideas in my head and come up with new things. And I could do stripping at night and I'd make about 200 grand a year doing that. So it's a pretty good plan B. That's more money than most people make make 200k a year in australia you're in the top four percent or the top one percent because it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and that's a plan b imagine what your plan a could be if that was your plan b and then you let your mind go crazy and then you play the game rather than taking it so seriously and so brittle or, or so uh how are you gonna articulate this so um rigidly that you allow for the flexibility, you allow for the malleability, you, you allow yourself to be the blade of grass within the wind so that you can change and pivot and augment and evolve as it goes on, which I don't think you can do if you're taking it seriously, which it's, it's really cool and no coincidence that Alan Watts uses this as one of his main lessons that I told this story before, but my granddad came to me in a, a uh, psychedelic trip and told me to stop taking my life so seriously and lo and behold he was fucking right <laughs> the place that i was two years ago to where i am now uh radically fucking different and really the perpetuation of that advice has been fundamental 
to, to the changes. So I definitely recommend you consider it. Uh, trying to define yourself is like trying to bite your own teeth. It is a knife trying to cut itself. It is a flame trying to burn itself. It is water trying to drink itself. I know this sounds very strange to listen to because you're like, yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? Trying to conceive of yourself. We're very good at being defined by these social roles. My name is, my job is, my income is, the where, where I was born, where I live, blah, 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 blah. Who I am related to, all these sorts of things. And this was a real mind fuck for me when I really started getting into it. And uh, Ram Das has a really good explanation. He goes, basically what people think of when they look out into the world, when they're on, say they, they use a, a television set analogy to perceive existence. He goes, on channel one, you look at everybody just as people, as, as individuals. Like you look at this person as a black person. You look at this person as a Chinese person. You look at this person as as a uh, Korean or English or British or Australian or German or anything like that. That's, that's like a level one basis, male, female, very binary uh, labels. Level two, when you turn the channel, you go to, oh, well, this person's uh, angry or this person's a narcissist. You, you, you go into like a, a personality viewing window. You go, this person's a sadist or this person's a cynic or this person's an optimist or this person's a fucking deluded idiot. And that's level two. And it's any wonder that most people have really shit existences because they just see level one and level two. They say, well, you're different from me. You're a different color. So I'm going to stay away from you because you're different. We need to be separate. Or if they get past that level, they go to level two where they, oh yeah, but your personality, I don't really like that because you're angry all the time and I don't want to be around that. Then you start ripping into some esoteric material and some philosophical things. And maybe you even dabble down the, the psychedelic pathway and you get to level four. And fuck level three. No one cares about level three, but you get to level four and you go, huh, I see you different on the outside, but what's looking back at me is a version of me inside of you. And you look at him, you're like, how did you get into that one? What the, f what's going on there? How did you, uh, how have you gotten here? And you, you start to become profoundly curious and interested instead of judgmental. And I'm not very good at this, mind you, for the, for the majority of my life. I'm a judgmental guy, most, most, mostly. Um, but when you do start to think of a different level of consciousness, you start to think in interesting patterns. And I, I have started to slowly shift towards the, uh, the curiosity stage where you're like, why do you act like that? Like, so I am me and you are you and we're both intrinsically the same. Extrinsically, we couldn't be dif more different. But if we are intrinsically the same, we're made up of the same stuff. How did you get into that version of me? Because if we are... We are made by the same chemicals, the same DNA. Obviously, it has its variants and everything like that, but a really easy way to think of it is two arms, two legs. We've got eyes, brain, lungs, heart. All the very similar makeups make you and I, except we look completely different, but we're not. And this is where trying to define yourself becomes very difficult. At level one and two, it's very easy. You look at all your social roles, you look at all your names, you look at your characteristics. Well, I'm a white guy, I'm this tall, I'm this heavy, blah, blah, blah. When you get to level four and you see that you are behind the eyes of the other person that you're looking at and that it's all connected because the only reason I know that I exist is because you exist. And the only reason that you could see me is because there's a background behind me. If there was no background and I was everything in the lens, then you wouldn't know where I begin and where I stop. So I need these things in relation to me to be able to figure out that I exist and it's the same thing that you need other people to figure out that you are separated from them but you're not because if they didn't exist neither would you because you only re exist in relation to these things so th this is kind of where people to go back into the first quote take it serious they go well all these expectations are held of me because I am a certain person I am a certain thing I grew up in a certain place I have a certain job I'm related to certain people I come from a certain family I mean, yeah, you do, but it's not who you are. At the deepest root, the, the deepest essence, 
if you really go down deep into the psychological sort of thing or the esoteric or the philosophical depths of these things, you start to realize that you are everything. You're, you're, the, uh, you're the ocean in a drop, not the drop in the ocean. And as soon as you start to see it like that, there becomes this lowering of angst or existential dread or fear or uh, disdain for existence because you're not seeing things as, and again, I'm not very good at this at the moment, something I'm working on, but you, you stop seeing people as enemies. You stop seeing people as other than yourself. You, you start to have a little bit more compassion for individuals when you go, yeah, look, they're, they're a bit of a dickhead, but you know, it's just me at the end of the day. And you don't take yourself so seriously as a result of that either because you think, well, I'm a fucking loser. I fail all the time, everything. But if this narrative is true and this lens is true that you're basically every human who's ever existed, you're part of the whole and the whole is part of you, well, then you're also all the successful people. You're also all the people who have been triumphant. You're also all the people who have overcome obstacles. You're also over the, the people who have achieved incredible, ridiculous things. There's a certain feeling you get when you watch high-level achievement in, in say, sport. And I get this all the time when I watch high-level achievements in sport where it might be like a, a, a crazy shot put or a, a, an extreme swim or an extreme run or something of that nature. You get goosebumps when you watch it. And it's it's just a fascinating thing. It's it's so fascinating. And it's it's why do you share the excitement of that human who you don't even know, who you've probably never even met, achieving a specific thing that doesn't really mean all that much to you because you're probably not in the same field, you've never even played that sport. Why why does that get you so giddy? It's because in one way or another, that's you. And even if not, it's a representation of what you could do if you stay focused or if you espouse the same traits as they have or uh, you could have a relatively similar achievement in the same scale in another area as, as that person has. So they went from being somebody who was rather unskilled, rather clumsy at their sport because not everybody is a natural talent when they begin and usually the people who are natural talents are the ones who don't really make it very far. But they worked on it and they honed and they crafted and they augmented, they changed, they manipulated, they, they figured out a specific set of things that worked for them and they, they carved and curated that over a long period of time to be able to present the finished product of them winning that race that you got to be a part of by watching them do it. And then that made you feel excited. So in a way, you could start to use that as a, in a metaphorical sense of you being in that person as much as that person is you and then use that as the example you're like well they're they're the same as me not on the outside because they look completely different but they're the same made of the same stuff as i am so why can't i achieve the same thing that they've done in the same field in another field in a different field it, it, it really doesn't matter what you apply this methodology to but the fact that you can do it because another version of you has done it and if, if you only look at people as other versions of you, the world becomes a pretty cool place. It, it really does. You don't have to be cynical about it. You can take their example um, to heart more genuinely, not seriously, but more genuinely because it's you. So I think it's an interesting concept. I really like it. Muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. No amount of anxiety has ever, ever changed an outcome. Ever. Never. So leave it alone. Uh, Alan Watts has another quote that's similar to this. He's like, you're trying to smooth out rough water with a flat iron or a hammer. It's never going to work. You, you can't. It's a really distinct Buddhist philosophy. And the the real ethos, at least as I understand it, to the Buddhist philosophy is that your power to intrinsically allow yourself to not react 
to everything, people, places, circumstances, and things is your one and only superpower. So somebody could say something hateful towards you and you just don't react to it. It's like the old, um, what it's the, like the old bully analogy where they're like, uh, parents are giving their advice for kids that are getting bullied and they're like, well, if you just don't react, well, then they don't get any pleasure out of picking on you. So they'll never speak to you again or they'll never come and pick on you because there's no effect there. There's no second dance partner. It's the same thing essentially for life as, as far as I've understood it. Because if you're not the one that keeps getting bogged down by your reactions to perceptually anger-driving things or perceptually depressive types of things or things that have the potential to make you sad or things that have the potential to make you feel like an idiot or like a loser or like a failure and you just don't react to these things you just leave them where they lay you you see the middle ground of all of them you see the nuance of all of them and you're like well you know uh getting getting a fucking door slammed in my face while i'm trying to sell door-to-door sales is just getting a door slammed in my face it doesn't mean that that person thinks that I'm a loser, therefore I have to think of myself as a loser, therefore I have to govern all my actions from this point on as a loser. It just means that they slammed the door in my face. And it doesn't mean that they were having a bad day so I can rationalize it and justify it, the fact that I didn't get the result because they were having a bad day because that's something out of my control. It really just means they slammed the door in your face. And that's all it is. So when you look at it as the middle way and you look at it as the common ground, you look at it as, as what it is and you don't react. As Alan Watts says, muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. There's no inference that you can put on that statement that would really make it any different. You could justify and you could change it and you could come up with all these wonderful, glorious stories. You probably never get it right. And that's why... I keep falling back into this mode of thinking, which I believe is correct, obviously, at least the correct way for me to look at the world, is that it's all about your perspective because reality is this crazy thing that we are all trying to understand as we go through it every single day. And it's going to be a different perspective from every single person on earth looking at the same thing. So therefore the one who creates the world that they see has to be you. I don't see how it works any other way because again, we could use the color example. If we both look at this, we can both probably say that it's gold with black and white. However, it's very difficult to say that it's the same gold to you that it is to me or the same black that it is to you that it is to me or the same white. And obviously black and white are a bit of an easy example. Gold's a little bit more uh, nuanced but the the idea is that we're really not seeing the same thing happen and this is the whole chinese whispers phenomenon people see something happen and then they tell you about what happened and then by the time it gets to you five people down the road it is a completely different story so now your perspective is being completely augmented based off what one person thought one person said from another person from another person from another person based on all their perspectives and it's not just their perspective of what they said it's their biases of what they're bringing to the table as they're being talked to if i don't like somebody very much i'm not going to be listening very intently i'm probably going to get the bare bones of the conversation then i'm going to have to fill in the gaps so that i don't look like an idiot pretending that i was listening and you could see how that would muddy up the water quite a fair bit but that's you trying to look at it from somebody else's perspective and trying to like take into consideration with them and thinking about how they look at things and how that means what that means to them there's so much of that that exists so the best way to clear all that muddy muddy water up is just to fucking let it go so leave it alone you're never going to figure it out you're never going to figure out the exact reason why someone said something to somebody else that said something to you so you go all right that's what they said No need to get upset about it. No need to get angry. No need to try and reason as to why they said what they said. They said what they said. That's it. Fucking move on. Leave it alone. The meaning of life is just to be alive. So plain, so obvious, and so simple. And yet, 
Everybody rushes around in a great panic as if it were necessary to achieve something beyond themselves. That's nice, isn't it? It's fucking lovely. Um, there's that old phenomenon that you are one in four, I think it's 400 trillion. I think it's a one in 400 trillion odds that you come out the exact way that you come out being born as a human that you are at this current time at this current stage with the features and different bits and pieces that you have pretty fucking crazy and ridiculous and when you think about it when you go back i don't know maybe a thousand years and people just existed they had farms to eat they had animals to kill and eat and obviously they'd raise things and um they'd spend a majority of their day working on fulfilling that existence essentially so they could live and eat and sleep and do whatever they need to do but you think about it from that perspective and you're like, yeah, they, they just kind of existed, huh? I mean, I'm sure there was people who were conquerors and farm tyrants who wanted to have more farmland than the next guy over and the next guy over and the next guy over. And there's all sorts of that, a litany of that through history. Obviously, you've got like Napoleon and all those characters, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, uh, all these people. But when you think about even in the Roman times, there's a, a, a real going around of like a Roman um, schedule of what this guy used to do with his day. He used to wake up, have breakfast with his family, go down to the Roman baths and talk about philosophy and, and talk about um, their days of what they were doing and what they were attempting to um, bring into reality in forms of ideas it was very ideas heavy they talked about ideas not people uh, that's usually a good hallmark of if you're hanging around the right people they'll be talking about ideas and concepts and history and those sorts of things versus people and what this person said and what that person said and what was on married at fucking first sight like anyone actually gives a fuck um but his day was very basic at least by today's standards there wasn't a lot of work involved there wasn't a lot of uh, financial domineering and conquering and trying to get the shiny object because they lived very basic lives. They, they, they ate, they spoke, they spent time with their loved ones. They communicated uh, communally as a tribe or as a city or as a town. And these guys' kids would play with these guys' kids and these guys' kids would join them and the, the adults would all talk about concepts and ideas and everything else. They'd go home for dinner where dinner would be prepared and they'd go to sleep. Maybe they look at the stars for a little bit. Maybe they don't. Maybe they farm for a little bit. Maybe they don't. And it's such a radically different way of living compared to now where we wake up and we're automatically in a fucking stress state because somebody at a different part of the world of us has sent us a message that may or may not be good or bad. The first thing you do when you wake up you turn over, you pick your phone up, you're like, oh. But when you think about it, logically, you think, I'm letting this little black mirror box device thing tell me what to feel based off what somebody else said that I'm interpreting using my own biases that may or may not be good and that I'm decided to govern my day based on that because I'm angry now. <laughs> it just seems so much more complex and so much more unnecessary. And you even think about it in terms of what today's day and age means back in terms of the, the Roman times. And we think, well, we wake up and we go to work for eight hours a day, most of us. And then we come home only to try and recover from that eight hours of grueling, soul-crushing, disgusting work for somebody else, basically. Only so that we have the opportunity, especially in today's day and age, in 2024, the opportunity to potentially maybe buy a house that we could live in so that we could house our families and eat food and exist. And that the majority of our working lives today are spent attempting to attain what these Roman guys had all day, every day with zero struggles, zero resistance in, in regards like shelter and food. And that we don't even really get to spend all that much time doing those things 
because the things that they had inbuilt via their farming techniques and um, via their uh, their right to housing, we we don't get to we we spend all our time trying to fulfill those two things that we get no time to do anything else, none. And so it's this all wretch and no vomit, which is another Alan Watts quote, because we're raising kids to grow up like we grew up and do things only for the sake of continuing to do them so that we can go on living. And no one's really getting a fuckload of enjoyment out of it. And I tell you, I, I talk to some extremely affluent people a lot of the time, and they say the same things at the very, very, very tippy top. They're driving fucking Lambos and Aston Martins and living in million dollar mansions and all these sort of things. And they go, yeah, my house is nicer and my car is faster and my food tastes somewhat better on weekends, but I'm still working 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And yeah, I'm getting a, a higher proportionate reward as a result of that work. And it brings me some more fulfillment than it probably does uh, going to work every day laying bricks, but still it's it's for the attainment and, and there's there's different devils at every level. It's for the attainment of a match to the results that you've gained. So when you're earning $10 million a year, you probably want a house that's worth two or three so that you're sufficing the upgrading of salary with the upgrading of lifestyle. So really it's all relative. The person that earns a hundred grand um probably wants a house that's three, four, five hundred thousand. Something something in that nature. If you can find that in Sydney, let me know. Um, but they probably want something of that nature, or that's within their within their budget. And it's the exact same thing as somebody who's on five million who wants a house that's ten or fifteen million. It's the exact same thing. It's just different relativity. So really they're they're playing they're playing the same game almost. It just looks different on the outside. And I, I think about this quite a fair bit. It's like how much of life stresses would continue that are currently today if we went back to a societal uh, a, a societal value structure where housing was incredibly cheap and basically everyone farmed for their own food and we all did that, where we could basically converge on the fact that we would talk about ideas and concepts and things and philosophy and what things meant and have good, honest uh, discourse not so that we could differentiate from each other, but so that we could come together in the unification of minds to perpetuate really good ideas. And not so that we could specifically get a an attainment of a result out of it, but that it was sufficient in its own right to just speak about ideas for the fact that we wanted to converse about things that we deemed important or things that we didn't deem important. And we could just exercise this childlike wonderment about what does this mean to you and what does this feel like to you and try this on for size and uh it's, it's like when you're when you're speaking to people and you're jousting each other with uh with different jokes and you don't know whether the joke's going to land or not you, you say something and it completely blows the head off the other person you never anticipated that it's the same thing for like philosophical ideas i've watched people's eyes keel over when i'm talking about philosophical things like they can't wait for me to shut the fuck up and on the opposite end of the spectrum, I've watched people's light, eyes completely brighten the fact that I explained something to them that had, they had such difficulty coming to the conception of and that that could completely revolutionize their entire life. Imagine if that was the basis of conversation for most people to, to share ideas that they had otherwise come up with or uh, been uh, ex like they had, they had experienced or they, they'd been exposed to as a result of somebody else doing it and somebody else doing it that you could play with it and see what you could make of it and see what you how you could manipulate it and augment it i think that would be a, a really cool existence and to to go back to that it's that basically is just being alive there wasn't this uh crazy ridiculously um rushed pace of things to achieve something other than what you are. And I'm obviously not saying don't reach for things, don't attain goals and, and uh, basically just give up. This is the common critique and the misunderstanding of the nuance of Taoism and Buddhist philosophy. They're not saying that you just give up everything. I mean, some of them, sure, Buddhist monks in the monastery have zero possessions and all that sort of stuff. 
um, but they live mer- very meaning and, and soulful lives because of, not because of that. They live very meaning and soulful lives in spite of that. Because you can be happy with a lot, you can be happy with a little. And that's generally how people get a lot. They don't have an aversion to having very little. Just like I was talking about when I started my, my business with $400 just for shits and giggles. I was like, what, what's going to happen? I'm going to go worse than this? Probably not. Um, but it's the fact that all, all of this, all the summation of this is to say that you don't have to achieve anything more than you are. Do it because you want to do it. Do it because you're interested in it. Do it because it, it piques your interest. Do it because it tickles your curiosity. You're not doing it to make yourself rich so that you can carry yourself around as a rich person and then uh, live underneath that archetypal structure that now exists as a result of you attaining some goal or that, that guy that becomes the, uh, the Ferrari guy and it makes it all about his personality where he wears the shoes and the polo shirt. And yeah, cool, you drive a Ferrari, but you, you know, it's all you fucking talk about. <laughs> it's, very, uh, it's very fleeting. It's very ephemeral. Um, it, it makes a big difference when you go and attempt to figure these things out intrinsically more as a as an unfolding of who you are and then how that then relates to everything else. And you, you get this when you start to speak to people who have a very firm grip on the idea of who they are and where they exist within. And they're, they're quite fascinating individuals because there's, there's depth to them. There's a soul there. There's... Uh, experience and wisdom and they've gone through things and i was talking about this yesterday on the podcast in a sense of the wins don't make you who you are it's the losses and the adversity and the the trials and tribulations and the things that you overcome it's the perseverance that makes you who you are not not the wins the wins are a nice additive a nice bonus the wins are a little bit of a nod from the the universal nature of things going you just don't fucking give up and to, to add to that point, that's not really too related to this. I, I really think that if more people govern their life with, you don't have to be religious to think this whatsoever. And if you are, that's fine. You could use whatever religious deity you believe in uh, to articulate this to yourself. But when you get to the pearly gates or wherever Allah lives or wherever Vishnu lives or whatever, uh, when you get to that, that end, that judgment day, Would you not want your deity of choice to look down and go, fuck, you gave it everything. I didn't expect a lot of you. I really didn't expect that you were going to go this far. I threw a lot onto your plate and you just kept asking for more. So I kept giving it to you and I was like, this is the one that's going to break him. And it never did. That's a story I would like to leave. When I get to 80 years old, I want those people that had been fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to say it in a sloppy turn of phrase uh, to exist alongside me and say those type of things. Like just whatever he did, he just fucking had a crack and really took it to the end of the road and really found depth within very simplistic things but had the ability to just go head first into them and charge forwards no matter what. And went through a ton of shit. Never sat there and whinged and bitched and complained, but just got on with it anyway. And was a shining example for those people who were going through shit at the same time who didn't think they could do it and then turn them into winners. That was another thing I was discussing yesterday is uh, what's the overarching theme and what's the overarching umbrella that is like the heuristic for your goal? Like obviously you want to attain cool things and you want to achieve certain results. But why? What What for? And I think I would like to also be known as someone who just figured, figured out more of who they were every single day and then led the charge to be an example of people who could do the same thing in a sense that that opens up so much opportunity for you to be able to move forwards because the more that you the more that you take away really go, to go back to the muddy water quote the, the more that you leave it alone really that you get to define who you are based on who you tell yourself you are not based on everything external and i think the more people that can do that the the better the world gets 
the more people who can have the intrinsic battle be the, or the intrinsic involvement be the only involvement rather than the extrinsic where you have like compensatory measures just like i was talking about with the the ferrari guy with no personality or the girl who's attractive but fucking sucks to be around everybody knows these people they're compensating for extrinsic things for the lack of intrinsic depth and i would really like to go back to that time period just to see how it was where all the romans were hanging out in the baths and discussing politics and ideas and um what was important to them for that day and age and i'm sure they had their own problems i'm sure i'm glossing over some some issues that, that they were currently dealing with but it would be very interesting uh this is the real secret of life so we've already got the meaning if you were interested this is the secret to be completely engaged with what you are doing in the here and now and instead of calling it work realize that it is play this has been a pretty a pretty heavy governing factor and uh thematic style of learning for me with this whole jiu-jitsu thing i've never ever ever once looked at it like it's work even though you could rationalize that and say it's how i make my money and uh it's a job now and it's not a job i fucking love doing it it's such a fun ride and a thrill and even when you don't feel like doing it you go and you never regret it ever it's like going to the gym and lifting weights and getting a fucking saucy pump you never come out of that going that was a mistake that was a regret and jiu-jitsu is that for me and i'm sure some other people have had different experiences maybe if they're underneath me probably um but it, it's just one of those things that is completely engaging and if you're completely engaged within it and you see it as play in a jiu-jitsu specific example you see somebody that scores on you or see somebody that submits you in the training room or stuff like that and you don't take it seriously because it's part of the game for you to be able to submit somebody you have to risk being submitted for you to score on someone you have to risk being scored on and you can become very brittle in your approach by <laughs> narrowing those windows and deciding not to go balls into the walls and avoid mistakes by cutting off curious uh by cutting off your creative expansion because people who don't want to get scored on and don't want to get submitted because it bruises their ego they don't they're not very creative they're more limited in their thinking because they want to stop you from doing things rather than be their own version of them and that's when they stop seeing it like a game and they're also not completely with it they're completely with i don't want to look bad rather than being completely with let's play the game of what this actually is and think about work like that think about business like that think about parenthood like that think about relationships like that what's the game the, the game isn't all sunshine and rainbows. The game has equal parts of ups and downs, lights and darks, blacks and whites, lefts and rights. There's always going to be things that are left of center. There's always going to be things that are traveling upwards or traveling downwards. You, you have this colloquial example where your business is going really well, but your relationship might be suffering a little bit or vice versa. And that's the game. The, the, the game is to be played. The game isn't to win on all fronts. The game isn't to achieve on all fronts. The game is to play the game and continue playing it every single fucking day. And if you can reconcile that, you probably will get outsized returns because you're playing it every single day. If you play, I don't even know what a fucking game is. If you play Tetris every day, you're going to get pretty fucking good at it eventually. You're going to be shit at the beginning. You're going to fuck it up all the time. You're going to make mistakes and have backwards uh, runs of success the momentum might not be with you and you you'll go through streaks of doing really well and doing really poorly but eventually you keep playing it you'll get better same thing with chess same thing with checkers same thing with blackjack same thing with you know same thing with all these different games the more you do it the better you'll get at it as long as you're approaching it in the correct light light same thing with jiu-jitsu it's unrealistic to expect that you wouldn't get better just by continuing to play the game it's the same as business and if you really get with it, people can sense it. If, if you really get with it, like you know those, um, those people in customer service 
that they're just showing up to get paid and they, they don't go any extra mile. They're like, what do you want? And you tell them and they're like, five dollars, please. They fucking suck. They suck to be around because they don't see it as a game. They only see it as a means to an end to get their eighteen dollars an hour or whatever it is. But you get the people that play it as a game, like customer service is a game, and I'm gonna have as much fun playing the game as possible. You rock up to the counter like, bro, that's a fucking sick shirt. And they're like, Oh, thanks, man. Like uh, my missus got it for me or whatever, or it's my favorite color or this is my favorite show. You get them talking about it. You're like, oh, I should probably take your order now, right? Because that's what you're here for. Like, oh, I got, I got so distracted, whatever. You're just playing the game at that point. You're not being too too serious. You're not being too rigid. You're not being too structured. And you, you get that with, with people who take their role too seriously. There's a security guard. He's actually not a bad guy. I fucking had a chat to him today, but he takes his whole security job pretty seriously down at the plaza. And um, I'm parking over two spots like a fuckwit, but you know I don't want trolleys and other people to hit my car because not a lot of people like the things that they have. I really enjoy the things that I have because I've worked hard for them, and I don't want other people to just dismiss that. But anyway, he uh, takes his job very seriously. He's like, you can't do that. And I just explained it to him, and he's he's playing the game very seriously of of more cop. And I'm like, you, you know, you don't have to be this serious. You know, we can just be less serious about this and i like i took that approach with him as well I, I didn't like chew back at him or anything like that i was like listen man look it happens people are disrespectful with their possessions but i would like to be respectful of mine and then not have a, a bad thing happen to me where people fucking throw trolleys into your car and all that sort of thing we've heard all the horror stories before and then he actually opened up a little bit and said that that had happened to him and he completely understands what i'm doing now so you, you play the game a little bit and you don't play the role so seriously you actually get a little bit more out of people than you realize that it was you was the one who was shutting everything down and closing everything off and not giving the opportunity because the only difference between the person uh, the customer service person in the first example to the second example was their outlook of how the game is to be played if your outlook of the game is to be played that you are only going to suffice it so much that you get paid at the end of the day well, then you're going to completely miss all the opportunities for all the fantastic conversations that you could have had with all these interesting people. Because I think coffee is the most or second most traded substance on earth. And if you think about that, that's a lot of fucking customers. That's a lot of interesting people. Like, why did you come into this cafe today? What piqued your interest about this? Or, you know, why do you use almond milk or almond water? why do you pick that instead of that and just being curious and playing the game a little bit and you'll find out that you have a ton more interesting conversations than you would have otherwise but it's only because you changed your tact and it's only because you're getting with the game that you're playing and you're seeing it as a game you're not seeing it as this very serious and rigid and because no one wants to be around that cunt let's be honest you are under no obligation to be the same person you were five minutes ago I really like this one. Who decides that you're a dickhead? You do. But it's only in relation to somebody telling you that you're a dickhead because you're not know going to tell yourself you're a dickhead. So even if you were genuinely being a dickhead in some example of some person's perspective in some conversation that you had, you don't have to continue your day as with the dickhead hat on and just fucking make it make sure everyone else in your life thinks you're a dickhead you don't have to it's the same thing as you could have a scenario where you blow your top and you get really angry about something you like the fucking buyer comes out and then 10 minutes later you go i'm over it now you don't have to be the angry guy anymore you can put the angry hat on you just take it off five minutes later don't put any other hat on. Who gives a fuck? You don't have to be one certain type of person. And this is a really cool um, time setting structure. It's like a five minute window. Let's say you lose a match in a jiu-jitsu tournament and you feel like shit. But then five minutes goes past and you forget that you're a loser. Because if you had the men in black fucking silver stick thing and they just blooped your memory, do you still feel like that person? Well, of course not because you fucking forgot. And there's there's millions of examples in your own life in your own history of things that you have forgotten about that people see you in a certain light because of the way that they remember you which means there are infinite possibilities of how you are seen to the world 
which means some people think you're a massive cunt. Some people think you're an absolute delight. But you don't have to be that person based on what other people are saying because there's so many different perspectives and so many different examples of how you are to each person that for you to continually look at yourself in a certain light is only your doing and your choice. And if you reconcile that, that you don't have to be seen as a certain way, well, then you're free to play the game however the fuck you want. You don't have to be the the guy that always uh, gets angry when the slightest inconvenient comes through or you don't have to be the guy that uh, gives up so easily because historically you have given up so easily. You can decide not to be that person and it can be a five-minute change. You, you can do something for 10 years in a row and then something catastrophic in your life changes and then you immediately change your tune to being some completely other different individual. Like uh, you, you start to exercise the fact in your mind that mortality is a very real and distinct thing because one of your family members dies. And now you don't live life as if it goes on forever. You completely change your perspective and you actually take uh, time to appreciate things in your life because they won't be here forever. That change didn't necessitate, it did not require the person in your life dying for you to necessitate that change. You always had the power to change your outlook whenever, whenever, whenever you wanted. It, it didn't take anything special. It didn't need to take anything special. This is why people that only change their health routine when they have a diabetes diagnosis hanging over their head, it's a very strange way to do it. Just taking yourself all the way to the worst end and then trying to pull yourself all the way back up. What a fun challenge that would be. I mean, David Goggins did it, so you can fucking do it. So get off your ass. Um, but yeah, you don't have to be the person you said you were five minutes ago. So if you mis you made a mistake two weeks ago, that you're still thinking about. Fuck, let it go. <laughs> Shit happens. If you measure yourself by the mistakes that you've made, you always always have something to complain about. But if you don't, and you just accept that it's part of the game, that you're not always going to have hot streaks and wins and crazy momentum, well, then you'll get over it. You'll be good to go. Through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witnesses through which the universe becomes conscious of its glory, of its magnificence. That's a pretty good one. Um, essentially, how I've taken the, uh, the esotericism out of that and tried to put that in a more logical format is that right now, what you're viewing through your eyes is just light and light in of itself uh well, sound is probably an easier one to explain sound without your ears is just vibration through the atmosphere that's all it is and it's that old uh i don't even know if it's a koan or because i don't think it's buddhist a, a, a koan is like a question with no answer that makes you really think really hard it's like what's the sound of one hand clapping um, but if a tree falls in the woods and no one there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Well, it makes vibration, but it doesn't make a sound until it hits ears that perceive it as a sound. So where does the universe go if we don't exist? It goes away because we don't have the ability to convert light into sight. Or we don't have the ability to convert vibration into noise. We don't have the ability to convert chemicals into taste or whatever the fuck the version of it is for smell or uh atoms with 99 percent space between them into touch we don't have these senses well then these things don't even really make sense because they're just atoms and vibrations and light particles and photons just fucking flying around all over the place and it looks completely different this exact room exact way that it's set up looks completely different to a bee. And that's a weird example, but let me go on. A bee sees things via ultraviolet so that when it flies over the top of a flower, it can see the pollen through, basically think about it like red light, um, infrared goggles where you can see heat signatures. That's how they see things, but it's in ultraviolet. And snakes see in infrared as they're part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they actually um, 
use their tongues to like taste the the area around them. It's, they're really weird animals. But to snakes and bees, this room looks completely fucking different. The, the purples are all off, the reds are all off, the, all the different colors. And that's because they see a different part of the, the spectrum than we do. So if we don't have the apparatus to perceive that it's there, well, then what is it? What is it really? Is the snake's view correct? Is ours wrong? Or is the bee's view correct? And is ours wrong? Or are they, they all wrong? Because we're really just converting it based on the apparatus that we have into what we see, taste, touch, feel, smell. There's a really interesting point. You can get quite... Um, you can get quite with that and think about how your perspective can be augmented and changed based on the fact that you understand the, the physics nature of, of the universe. Um, the, the one that really trips most people out is the, the ocean isn't really blue. It's just a reflection because water's clear. When you think about it, everyone's like, no, water's blue. It's, like, it's fucking not. Pull water out of the tap. Does it come out blue? No, it doesn't. So why do we think it's blue? Because that's our perception. So it's very interesting. You think about how you perceive things and it starts to change your mind a little bit. The more a thing tends to be permanent, the more it tends to be lifeless. Well, I'm going to be brutally honest. I don't really have a summation of that because I don't know what it means. So I might go do some research on that one. A scholar tries to learn something every day. A student of Buddhism tries to unlearn something every day. I think this will be a good one to, to finish on. We have all these preconceived ideas that we're meant to be this person based on things that people have told us that we are and that's not your behavior and, you know, how the fuck do you know that's not my behavior? I don't even know what my behavior is. <laughs> what are you going to tell me my behavior is? The Buddhist way of looking at things is unlearning these things. Well, I'm a loser because I got born into this situation, so that means that I have to curtail to this story and this example of myself because where I grew up was poor and blah, 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 blah. The scholar tries to learn a way around that to solve a problem that doesn't exist in the first place. Whereas the Buddhist takes the reverse engineering standpoint and goes, well, I'm just going to unlearn that I think that that's true. Because what's the difference between you thinking something's true and it's not? It's just a thought. Whether you think it exists or it doesn't. Look at the, the last five years of how many people believed a certain thing was so crazy and so deadly and... Now 99% of those people are completely back to normal. What's the difference? I mean, there's a lot of examples that you could use of just being bombarded by the same words again and again and again until you believe it. But just because you've heard something a thousand times doesn't mean it's true. Just because someone keeps shouting in your face doesn't make them right. So the, the Buddhist way is very interesting and we, we struggle with this in the West because we're very logical, very analytical, very science-based. Um, and we try and learn about how things work and how things tinker. And this is actually a really another good point on perspective that 20 to 30 years ago, we had no idea what quantum physics was. We had no idea. We had no idea what the, uh, the, the really deep depths of space looked like in a HD image because the telescopes weren't advanced enough to look into the deepest depths. Does that mean it wasn't there? No, of course not. It was always there. It's just that we did not have the apparatus of which to perceive it. Which means that there's a lot of shit going on that we don't understand. There's a lot of shit that's happening that we have no idea how it works or what it looks like or what it really is. And so this is why your perspective can be... You, you, can, hold, you can hold a belief strongly, uh, uh, but, but be ready to change it quite quickly. Uh, so you can hold... Sorry, you can hold a belief uh, loosely... You can believe in it, but you hold it loosely because it might change based on the way that you perceive something or based on some new technology that comes out that completely changes the way you look at things. And if that's true, well, then all the ones about yourself can be changed too. That you're a loser or a dickhead or a failure or, I don't know, whatever you're accused of being. I'm accused of being a lot of shit on the internet. I don't give a single fuck. This is not how I see myself. Because I take the jovial gamification approach of, well, who am I going to be today? I get to choose. Am I, am I going to be the super serious fucking tough fighter guy? Or am I not? Because I don't have to be. Uh, and it's only people's representation of you that they're going to see anyway. They're never going to see the internal workings. And that's kind of like the secret game you get to play with yourself. You're like, oh, well, I get to decide what 
what I'm really going to do today and how I'm going to feel and how I'm going to operate. And I, I get to be the fucking one in the driver's seat and I get to be the director of the movie and no one else really, really gets a say unless I let them. So I think it's interesting that you, you have that perspective and that's, that's really an unlearning philosophy. An unlearning philosophy is that people, places and things outside of you don't determine who you are if you don't let them. So it's like, Sometimes in jiu-jitsu, when people come from shit schools to new schools, they got to unfuck a lot of things first before they can start learning the good stuff. That's life, really. I mean, we learn as kids that we're specific people because we made specific mistakes or that one kid that shits himself in year three. You're like, ah, poo pants. <laughs> you don't have to be that kid forever. You're really not. Five minutes can go by and you're still not that kid after you clean yourself up and get teased for years because you're the weird poo kid (laughs) but um you you can always you can always manipulate things and get better but you can unlearn that you don't have to be that person forever just because something happened to you previously and and things have gone right or wrong up or down or left or right uh doesn't mean that you have to be defined by it and that what you once thought was true you can always unlearn and that really the big kicker out of all that is that the outside shit defines who you are because it doesn't most people learn that lesson very early on because their parents tell them that they should be this way or that way or you should behave a certain way and you're not that kid so you don't behave like that you're like oh okay well i'm not that kid so i don't behave like that and eventually you got to unlearn that shit because they didn't even know what they're talking about and it depends on if it fits where you're sort of going and what you're doing with your life and whether that is a belief that serves you anymore because there's a lot of beliefs that don't serve people anymore Peter Crone, the guy that I mentioned prior, uh, previously, he does a, a lot of work with that sort of stuff where uh, people are like, yeah, I'm, I'm such a fuck up. I'm such a failure. And he's like, who's deciding that? Based on what? What factual evidence do you have to support your claim? And then they go through it and they reason with you why they're a fuck up and why they're a failure. And then he goes, all right, well, if we get a scalpel and we cut you open and we look for the label, the manufacturing label that said you are this person from this place that is a fuck up, is a failure am I going to find the label? And they're like, no. They're like, all right, well, then you're the one who's hanging on to it. So if you let go of it, it doesn't exist anymore. And you're like, oh, there you go. So think about that. If you're not where you want to be in life, maybe it's just you telling yourself you're not where you want to be. Maybe that's all right. Maybe you can fucking get over it. (laughs) Anyway, that was a uh, second episode. We're not doing a third one because I think my brain's going to explode. Uh, And we'll see you next week when this one comes out.